Paul actually makes reference to it a lot. And one of the places that we find it is in Ephesians. And so I wanted to read to us a few verses from the book of Ephesians where Paul addresses the ascension of the Lord. And so this is going to be from Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 15 to 23. Paul writes, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Again, thanks be to God. Do you hear the description, the powerful description of who Christ is in this passage? That happens because of the ascension. So that Jesus was not simply resurrected from the dead, raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead and he ascended into heaven where he is ruler of all. He exemplified the life of a servant on earth. And now he has ascended to be the ruler of all. Now I wanted to point out a few of the parts of the ascension that I thought we might like. Because sometimes you just read scripture and you're like, that was nice. But sometimes as we read, it's important to be thinking about the parts that kind of stand out to us. So I want to point out some of the, the parts of the last part of this passage that stand out to me. So verses 20 to 23 of this passage really are the ones that focus, Paul focuses on the ascension. In verse 20, it says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And then in verse 21, it says, he's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And then in verse 22, he has put all things under his feet and made him the head over all things. Doesn't that all sound great? So the parts of the ascension... Paul's description of the ascension that I think stand out to me are these, these ideas. The power to raise the dead. Isn't that amazing? The power to raise the dead. We see that at work in Christ's ascension. Ruling over worldly power. How many times in just the last few weeks can we think of times when we would have loved to see the power of God at work over worldly powers? And then Jesus as head over everything. Jesus is the one in charge. We would like to see that. These are the parts of the ascension, the description of the ascension that for me stand out. And today, we're going to be talking about power. I don't know if you remember, but the first time I came here a few weeks ago, I said, we're going to be talking about power a little bit more. It's, it's a thing I'm thinking about a lot these days, so congratulations, you get to be, you know, the objects of my thoughts that are happening right now. So this idea of power is something that the Lord has been talking to me about. These these things that are described in the ascension, to me, are examples of what we think of as being power. Power to raise the dead. Ruling over worldly power. Jesus as head over everything. 
Now I'm gonna say something a little shocking, so I just want you to be ready, okay? There are some other people who I think we can see exemplifying all of these kinds of power. Some of them that I thought of were Hitler, Stalin, Hussein. They had the power over life or death. They were more powerful than so many other worldly powers. And they were in charge of what seemed to be everything. Now, obviously, at least I think it's obvious, none of those people are people that we would think of as being Christ-like. But if the power of God that we worship, the power that we worship, is like the power of these dictators, just bigger, or maybe the good version of it, then we are missing what God's power is. And we are worshiping the wrong kind of power. In fact, I would probably argue now that I'm thinking about it, we shouldn't be worshiping power at all. We should be worshiping God. So what is the difference, though, between the power that we see in our world and that we kind of see highlighted in this description of the ascension and what God's power really is? I want to point out just a couple of parts of this same passage and maybe look at them from a little bit of a different angle. In verse 20, so Ephesians 1, verse 20, it says, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The power that raised the dead first suffered and died. I'm going to say it again. The power that raised the dead first suffered and died. Those dictators would never have done that. They would never have sacrificed themselves. That's a distinction between God's power and the power that we see at work in the world. Now, verse 22, I'm going to get a little nerdy on you, but you're used to that by now, right? So it's going to be okay. Verse 22 says, And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church. The word head, we're going to talk about the Greek here. When I hear the word head, like he made him the head over all things, I tend to think of something that's like forceful and in charge kind of thing. But that's actually not what this word means in the Greek. And we know that because there's a couple of different Greek words that can be used for the word head. One of those words is arche. Arche is, it's where we get the word arch, like arch enemy, arch rival, right? The biggest of something, arche. That, in Greek, is what we use to talk about forceful or like in charge, like we think of as really powerful kind of a thing. But that's not the Greek word that's used here. The Greek word that's used here is kephale, and that word is all also translated as source which is a little bit different than what we would normally think of when we think of the word head. But try substituting the word source in the passage here, and you get, and he has put all things under his feet and has made him the source for all things for the church. I mean, there's still a powerful definition there, but it's very, very different than being in charge, forceful. So the power of God is not like the world's power. The power of God, the power that raised from the dead, first suffered and died. The power of God that makes Christ the head is the power that makes Christ the source. 
the one from which everything else comes, as opposed to the one that's over everything. What do we hear from this? God exalts vulnerable and sacrificial power. That is the kind of power that God exemplifies. Vulnerable and sacrificial. That's weird. Can I just say that? Is that weird? That's weird. Who thinks of power as being vulnerable and sacrificial? That doesn't even sound like power. That sounds like weakness. I think the Bible talks about things being upside down that way, doesn't it? So God exalts vulnerable and sacrificial power. I wanted to read to you a place where this actually happens. Do you remember, was it last Sunday that I talked about Isaiah? First, second, third Isaiah? So, you might remember, second Isaiah is the section of the book of Isaiah that a lot of scholars think was written during the exile. So this is when Israelites had been conquered by Babylon and had been forced into exile in Babylon. So they're not in their home anymore. They're probably very unhappy. They're probably grieving a lot. And so what we hear in 2nd Isaiah is a lot of prophecy to a people who are in grief. And I think I might have mentioned that portion of 2nd Isaiah is where we find a lot of the suffering servant passages. That's what I'm going to be reading from a little bit today. So I'm going to, this is actually a very long passage, so I'm skipping part of it. But I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. And just, it's just the last three verses of chapter 52. And then I'm going to skip a few verses and read from Isaiah 53, verse 7 to the end of the chapter. Some of this is going to sound familiar, but I want you to think of this. God exalts vulnerable and sacrificial power. Now hear this. Isaiah 52, 13. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you hear in that the suffering and the vulnerability of the servant? Now in the passage of Isaiah, the servant is not named. In the Christian tradition, we look back at passages like that and we say that was, that's Christ. That's a prophecy about Christ. If we are to do that, we can see exemplified there 
that God exalts vulnerable, sacrificial power. What in the world is the point? Like, why does any of this even matter? I am so glad you asked. <laughs> Two reasons this matters. First of all, this is meaningful in how we view power. And second, it's meaningful for how we seek power. So first, our view of power. If we can understand the distinction between God's power and the world's power, then we can understand that this vulnerable kind of power deserves our allegiance over the world's power. Now I'm just gonna guess, I'm not the only one in here who watches the news sometimes and just wants the good guy to come in and just sweep all the bad guys away, just do away with it, just somebody just take charge and just zap everybody that needs to be zapped, okay? <laughs> That's how I feel. And I'm gonna confess to you, I don't understand how vulnerable and sacrificial power can possibly be the answer to a world that is so violent and overwhelming. But God tells us what God's power is like through the life of Christ. And Christ didn't come through and zap all the bad guys. He kind of told them off sometimes with love and truth. But he gave himself. He sacrificed himself. And that's not, that's not what our world does. Those dictators I named, that's not what they're going to do, what they would do. And whatever dictators there are to come, because I'm sure there's plenty more, it's not their style. They don't use God's power. This vulnerable kind of power is what deserves our allegiance. So what does that even mean? That means that in our day-to-day -day lives, when we see power at work, the world's power, maybe don't praise that so easily. Um, when we see the world's power at work, maybe in our minds, acknowledge that's the world's power. And when we see the vulnerable, sacrificial power that exemplifies God's power, maybe give that our attention. And we see that at work in other places, places that are small and unnoticeable. Our healthcare workers that give of themselves every day. Some of them who probably had to tend to some pretty traumatizing wounds this week. Social workers who have to deal with the counseling and the provision of daily mental, emotional, physical needs of people. They give of themselves. Do they get paid much for it? I wish. No. We're giving all that money to the football players, which, as I said before, had better be good on the Chiefs team this year. <laughs> but these people who are giving of themselves for the livelihood of others, that is sacrificial power. That is God's power at work. Let's give that some attention. The teachers who are now taking a very well-deserved summer vacation, that is vulnerable and sacrificial power at work, giving of themselves for the sake of our kids. Let's give that some attention. We can see the ways that God's power is at work Let's give that more attention than we give to the world's power. The second idea here is the power that we seek. Now, I know none of us would want to admit that we actually seek power. That's a very selfish thing. But don't we all like to have just a little bit of control over things? Oh, I kind of like that. <laughs> Even that in this discreet form 
is the seeking of power. And maybe sometimes we're explicit about it. Maybe some of you are like, yeah, Deanna, I just, I'm, I totally just want it. It's fine. Just say it. I just, I want the power. I want the control. It's okay to admit, right? So what we seek in the way of power, of control, the world's version of power is affected when we think of the power of the ascended Lord. What we seek I'm going to read verse 17 from our passage, Ephesians 1, 17. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. That is what we need to seek. The wisdom, revelation, and knowledge of God and I'm not talking about some like lofty knowledge where it's like, I know more than you kind of knowledge. Although some of us really enjoy doing that. I may or may not be one of them. Like it's fun to know things, right? But this isn't, this isn't an intellectual knowledge. This is a relational knowledge. If we would seek instead of control, which again, I like, instead of control, instead of power, instead of whatever the things are that we're tempted toward, if instead we would seek closeness with God, wisdom, knowledge, real knowledge of God, the kind of knowledge that comes with spending time with the Lord, that leads us in the ways of God's power. That leads us in the ways of vulnerability and sacrifice. Verse 23, the very last part of the passage, talks about how God has put all things under his feet, has made him the head, the source for all things, for the church. Verse 23, the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That verse is a call for us as the church to live into the ways of Christ. To live as an extension of the vulnerable, sacrificial power of Christ in the world. Now those sound like pretty words, I suppose. If you really think about them, they sound like very unappealing words. Because how many of us actually would like to live in vulnerability and sacrifice? No thank you. And yet, this is what we are called to. And so you have the choice. You don't have to live this way. But I'm going to guess that you're here because you want to know God more. Maybe because you need to know God more. And if that's the case for you, this is a way to do that. To live as extensions of the vulnerable, sacrificial power of Christ in the world. How? We look for ways, opportunities to give of ourselves. Next Sunday, I think, is a great way to do that. So those who are going to be able to help with that, I think that that's one way that you can experience what it is to give of self. As we seek this power, as we recognize this power, it shows up in a few ways. Three ways, I'm just going to mention from a couple of verses. This vulnerable power shows up in faith. Verse 15 says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. It shows up, this vulnerable power, in love. Verse 15 again, I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. Faith, love, and hope. This vulnerable power shows up in hope. Verse 18 says, So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. God's vulnerable power shows up in faith, in love, and in hope. How? It shows up in faith because faith that is strengthened through trials is power. 
Do you hear that? Faith that is strengthened through trials is power. Love that overcomes hatred and apathy. By the way, have you ever heard that the opposite of love isn't hate? It's apathy. Like the idea of, I, don't, I just don't care. So apathy and hatred are both things that we probably don't want. We want love in our lives. And love that overcomes hatred and apathy is power. Hope that sustains life is power. Those are the things that make up the power of God, the vulnerable and sacrificial power of God. And so my question for you this morning that we will close with is where in your life can you live into this vulnerable power? Where in your life can you exemplify, can you live into God's power of sacrifice and vulnerability? I bet that the Holy Spirit will let us know this week if we'll ask to be shown. Would you pray with me as the worship team comes?